Welcome everybody to the wildlife trafficking panel. I hope you have enjoyed the conference so far and uh, I've been attending sessions. I've been learning a lot. Um, for this panel, we're focusing on wildlife trafficking. And DAJN has brought to you three expert journalists who have spent years tracking wildlife trafficking, and they are from National Geographic and leading outlets in the Philippines and Uganda. Um, so you will have the detailed bio in the chat. Uh, the great GIGN producers are po posting uh, their uh, bio there. And I will just introduce them briefly for their presentation. Please send your comments and questions in the chat function. And uh, we'll pick that up as we go along. Now, uh, is Rachel here? Rachel? No, not yet. She's on her way. Um, so let's have um, Jessica first, and she's from the Philippines. She is um, she over she is a journal from Manila, Philippines. Her work focuses on the climate crisis, wildlife, and biodiversity, um, and natural hazards and other environmental issues. Um, she has written extensively. And she has also prepared an extensive tip sheet, which will be uploaded for you. So uh, let's have Jessica. She'll talk about the uh, wildlife trafficking in the Philippines and also uh, in Asia. There are plenty of stories in Asia. Um, the, uh, with the, the Asia brings so diverse and so are the uh, wildlife. So Jessica? Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I hope my audio is clear and everyone can hear me. Uh, thank you so much to uh, the Global Investigative Journalism Network for having me and for our attendees uh, from wherever you are. Thank you for joining us. And so allow me to share my screen. Um, I hope everyone can see that. And as Ying has mentioned, um, I am from the Philippines. I am based in Manila. Um, and it's, it's evening in Manila at the moment. And today for this session, I'd like to talk to you about tracking wildlife traffickers and writing and reporting about wildlife crime um, in Asia in particular. So as mentioned earlier, my name is Josette Frina Inano and my contact details, my email and my Twitter username are on the screen. So just a bit of a background, as mentioned by Ying earlier, until very recently, I was the environment reporter of the Philippine Daily Inquirer. So the Philippine Daily Inquirer is one of the most leading newspapers, daily English broadsheets um, in the Philippines. And in, in my six years with the newspaper, I've extensively covered um, environment issues such as the climate crisis, but also biodiversity. And that gave me the pivot to look into wildlife trafficking and legal wildlife trade. As some of you may know, the Philippines is one of the richest in the world when it comes to biodiversity, but it is also a hotspot for wildlife crime. And I'll be drawing on these experiences as I go along with my presentation. And so initially, I think I was supposed to speak um, after Rachel, who is going to give us a more global perspective of wildlife trafficking. But while we are waiting for her, allow me to kind of just zoom in into uh, stories about wildlife crime in Asia. So I think one of the best ways if you are starting out or if, if you're already doing investigative reporting about the environment or wildlife crime in your own countries, in your own region, I think it bears without saying that you need to learn the wildlife issues in your particular area. And so Asia is a very diverse um, continent geographically and culturally, which means that there is an abundance of stories on wildlife crime, wildlife trade, and wildlife trafficking in this region. And so that unique 
uh, and very diverse geography and cultures and traditions are actually factors that play in the illegal wildlife trade and wildlife trafficking. So some of the few questions that you can um, use to, to guide your reporting is looking at the cross-boundary challenges of wildlife trafficking in Asia. So again, drawing from my experiences as a reporter from the Philippines, the Philippines has very porous boundaries. And so, for example, the wildlife, um, like the plants and the animals that are being trafficked in the Philippines often come from other countries, if not from the country itself. So some of the seized um, or rescued animals from enforcement operations come from nearby countries such as Indonesia and Papua New Guinea. And so the Philippines is not only um, a, a source point for, for biodiversity and wildlife, it is also a transshipment point. So it is important that in our reporting or in my reporting, for instance, it was necessary for me to look at entries and exit points. So for example, the Philippines is an archipelago. So looking at ports, customs, and even um, air travel. And so for more landlocked areas, it is also important to look at the issues in the boundaries um, when it comes to reporting on wildlife crime. And when investigating uh, uh, wildlife trafficking, I think it is also important that we need to expand the idea of what wildlife is. So usually there is a heavy focus on charismatic and iconic animals such as perhaps eagles or rhinoceros or tigers, elephants, but um, some other species are being overlooked. Um, and so it is also important to, to look at um, these other animals and even plants when it comes to uh, wildlife uh, crime reporting. Um, it's not necessarily important that their conservation status is endangered or vulnerable or threatened because um, it, it, it shouldn't mean that just because they are endangered that it, that's the one that merits an investigation. Because for example, in I, I, I had this uh, opportunity to learn about a particular reptile, the toke gecko in the Philippines. So it's, it's not really an endangered species, but because there was a period that uh, I think for a few years in the early 2000s that there were a lot of harvested um, toke geckos in the Philippines that it actually affected their populations. So it's important to look at what animals are often reported in seizures and what are not. So it also bears without saying that you need to learn, we need to learn the consumer demand and supply, who is trafficking what and where is it going, why and how. So it is important to look at the big picture, what are the patterns? So for example, if in this particular area, um, this certain species is being repeatedly harvested, maybe it merits uh, a deeper look into why this particular species is being harvested and who are the actors uh, behind this. When reporting about wildlife trafficking and wildlife crime in, in general, I think that it is also important to keep an eye on non-wildlife stories. So just a bit of a context, before I was the environment reporter for the Philippine Daily Inquirer, for several years, I was actually a crime reporter, and I was also reporting on the justice systems in the Philippines. And this is an important perspective because I think that it is important to remember that wildlife crime stories are not merely environmental stories. Yes, they focus on animals and plants and wildlife, but essentially these are stories of crime, of corruption, and of failed institutions. So it is important that we look into um, institutions, how they are functioning, if they are, and we are updated about developments that are happening outside that traditional wildlife environmental beat. And of course, when we do our reporting, it it is important that we highlight the implications of wildlife trafficking on other issues and sectors, such as public health, for example. So, for example, the trafficking of pangolins um, is being uh, seen as, as possibly one of the uh, reasons behind the pandemic that we are facing at the moment. And also, what are the implications of wildlife trafficking on traditions and culture? So, these uh, other perspectives in wildlife trafficking can further deepen our reporting. And it also answers that important question of why should people care? Because sometimes that's, that's the challenge on reporting about wildlife and animals and plants is that 
perhaps people just don't care about them. But if they do understand the implications on their daily lives, then it'll be, make them easier for them to understand. So here are just a, a few like tips and techniques um, in terms of uh, tra trade, uh, um, tracking wildlife traffickers. So people trail who to talk to. So you have, of course, your wildlife enforcers. Perhaps they come from your environment ministry or maybe from the customs department, from the police officials themselves. You have your local community. So I think that any good reporting requires an inclusive and participatory approach because essentially many of these communities are at the front lines of wildlife crime. Either they are forced into poaching because of poverty or other socioeconomic issues, but sometimes or oftentimes they get the short end of the stick. So talking with local communities who really have that deep intrinsic knowledge about wildlife and biodiversity is also very important in reporting wildlife crime. So of course, um, conservation groups are good resources when um, reporting about this topic academics and researchers from universities or perhaps other um, institutions that do uh, studies and extensive reports on wildlife, and of course, consumers themselves and the traffickers and poachers. So in my reporting, I find that it's very important to establish relationship and trust with your sources. Um, what I mean by this is that many of the tips and leads that I've followed through the course of my reporting on wildlife crime came from those conversations that are not necessarily for a single story itself. Like I keep a close communication with um, some wildlife law enforcers, with some um, wildlife experts whom I know are very much on the ground. And from time to time, they give me leads and tips about a certain seizure or a certain arrest or another repeated arrest of another known wildlife trafficker. And so these kinds of information, these tidbits of knowledge and, and monitoring, they may not necessarily lead to one single story already, but it could build into another story that could be actually part of your investigation. So when it comes to wildlife trafficking, I've found that it is important to keep a close eye on it almost all the time. So building perhaps a database where you monitor a particular species, for example, if you are following a particular species of bir birds or, or of turtles, and you really want to look into that. So just closely monitoring some arrests, some developments on that end, some discoveries um, or, or en entrapment operations, and having close communication with these sources beyond your usual shoe leather reporting could really be beneficial um, in the long run. If you find yourself in that situation when you have to interview traffickers or poachers, I think it it bears without saying to exercise caution and vigilance. Um, in, in my case, I have never had the chance yet to, to speak to an actual trafficker or poacher. Um, but I, I've come across uh, so many repeated names in the list uh, in, in, in my own monitoring. Like even the, the government officials or the law enforcers themselves are saying these are the same people coming in and out of the jails. And so if you do find yourself with that opportunity to talk with them, of course, exercise caution, um, let your newsrooms know, your newsroom managers or editors, if you are doing this kind of interview or reporting, just so you are also um, safe and, and protected in your reporting. Because um, wildlife trafficking is, is not just this small crime. It is actually one of the largest organized crimes in the world after human trafficking, narcotics, and arms. And so usually some of the actors that are involved in wildlife trafficking are also involved in these organized crimes. And so utmost protection for us journalists is necessary to keep in mind when we do our reporting. So um, I want to pivot a bit into, into um, a particular story that I did um, um, with the Philippine Daily Inquirer uh, in 2019. So when I, I first looked into wildlife trafficking in the Philippines, I found that there has been a change in the landscape. Um, wildlife trade and even new traffickers are sprouting not in the traditional spaces of, mark of physical marketplaces where they used to be in the past few years, but now they're 
on social media such as Facebook, Instagram, and even online forum boards. And so in, in the course of my reporting, I found that Facebook, where in the Philippines there are 65 million users in Facebook in 2019, um, I, the, the, the source of, of kind of the, the beginning of this story was through a report by an organization called Traffic, where they found that reptiles are being extensively traded and um, sold uh, on Facebook. And so I decided to expand on this and look at the other species that are being uh, traded and sold online. And through this reporting, through sources that I've cultivated over the years in government and conservation groups, I found myself in looking into more than 200 Facebook pages just based in the Philippines. Some of them have been created as far back as 2012 with like 45,000 members and nearly half of these are actually public um, so you can easily access them. So when you are doing these kinds of reporting online, it is important to know the language of the wildlife traffickers. So knowing the right keywords for your search will help um, narrow down um, your reporting or your investigation. So in my case, it was almost a no-brainer, actually. It was very interesting that some of the Facebook groups are named, quote-unquote, official black market of a certain species of a certain city. Some of them have the names of particular animals. So if you are following a particular species, perhaps in my case, there were uh, a group for Burmese phytons or for minas and other birds, of hornbills, for example, or other keywords such as exotic pets, exotic, exotic keepers. Um, sometimes in other e-commerce sites, they don't put the word ivory, but they give it another name, maybe like white something, or or even if actually, even if you, you search for ivory, sometimes, sometimes something pops up. And so just knowing the right keywords, you know, talking with conservation groups who are very much already um, into these kinds of research will also help you in that regard. So work closely with wildlife crime investigators and also cyber crime investigators. Uh, unfortunately, in the case of the Philippines, the wildlife crime, uh, wildlife law enforcers are also doing the cybercrime investigation. So if this is the case in, in, in your country or in your area, then you may find that they also lack the manpower to, to deepen their investigations even further. And so this is where you can also come in and um, expand their investigation in a way. And so it is very interesting to look in this story because uh, selling live animals is actually against Facebook's own commerce policies. They have a a very clear ban on buying and selling live animals on their platforms. That includes Instagram. But when I reach out to them, well, apparently it's still up to the users to just flag and report um, these crimes or these activities to Facebook. And that's when they will um, pull it down. Um, so uh, it's also important that when you decide to do your investigations online to, of course, protect your identity, use a dummy account on Facebook if, if, if you're doing your investigation on social media, use VPNs, encrypt your files, and have stronger passwords. So these are just some common um, digital security tips that you would also learn, I hope, from other sessions, or you may already know them for a fact. So another thing um, I'm kind of going towards the end of my presentation here is that um, it's also important that I found that when reporting about wildlife traffickers is to have a good follow through on what is actually happening to them. So there are a lot of reports already and even investigations on arrests, on seizures, on enforcement and entrapment operations. But there really isn't much of a discussion on what really happens after that. And so in this report that I did this year uh, with the support of the Oxpec um, investigative environmental journalism, um, I found that, you know, in the Philippines, wildlife criminals essentially get away with, with a slap on the wrist. Some of the penalties go as low as $10, um, and it, that does not even account the conservation status sometimes of the species that are involved. And so understanding the wildlife loss in your country is important. And following through with 
court records, for example, in my case, um, reaching out to to the judicial to the judicial systems, to the police, to to even litigations, who those who are doing litigations of wildlife crime, if you have them in your own country. Um, it is important to also look at this as to have that full picture if if prosecuting and convicting wildlife criminals is actually happening. I, I mentioned that this was the case. This is the case in the Philippines. A lot of wildlife criminals, wildlife traffickers essentially get away. And so they they come and go. It's like a revolving door in, in, in jails. So these are the same actors being jailed, paying a small fine, going out, continuing their trading or their trafficking and poaching online and offline. And so looking at gaps and loopholes in the prosecution and conviction of wildlife traffickers is also uh, very important, I think, in investigating uh, wildlife crime. And sometimes in the case of the Philippines, I find that the law itself was the problem because it does not have teeth uh, to, to actually uh, prosecute um, wildlife criminals. And so uh, in, in the course of this reporting and when I finally published it, one of its um, impact was that I found that the legislation is now moving and they're moving towards amending the law to make it much stronger. So here are just a few of the resources that I use in my reporting. Of course, CITES and IUCN Red List are, are very important sources of information about conservation statuses of, of wildlife, both flora and fauna. For Southeast Asia, where I am from, the ASEAN Center for Biodiversity and the ASEAN WEN are also good sources of information and experts to talk to. Um, Oxpeckers has a great project, had a great project, and I was involved in this with my previous reporting um, on Wild Eye Asia. So they do have this um, um, very comprehensive map um, of, of where wildlife crime is happening, of seizures, arrests, and convictions. So um, they are also online. You may, you may find that map. And I think my co-panelist, um, Estasha, will talk a bit more about Oxpeckers later. And organizations such as Traffic and the Environmental Investigation Agency, they have also reports and studies, as well as the Global Environmental Crime Tracker for the EIA, um, that tracks wildlife crime all over the world. Um, but of course, locally, it is also necessary to, to pursue a more data-driven investigation in your reporting. In my case, in the Philippines, there isn't actually a centralized database on wildlife crime. So what I find useful for, for my own investigations is to actually build on the existing database and add more as I go. So that's what I said earlier about mon consistent monitoring of of wildlife stories and arrests. So public records, court cases, and police reports are all good resources um, on investigating uh, wildlife crime. And so that's it from my end. Thank you so much for your patience and for your attention. Once again, my details are on the screen. Please feel free to get in touch and I'd love to answer your questions later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Rachel now is with us here. Uh, Rachel. Um, Rachel is the Hello. executive editor of the Animals Desk of National Geographic. I read the National Geographic, but I never know that there is a Animals Desk, which uh, covers all things animals. Um, so Rachel, are you here? I am here. I'm trying to start my video, but it says the host has stopped it. Uh -oh. There we go. All right. Hang on. There we go. <laughs> oh, great. Hello. Okay. Great to see you. Hello. Thank you for the introduction. I'm so sorry I'm late. I had a little emergency this morning, but I am ready to get started. Let me share my screen real quick. And here we go. All right. Whoops play from the start. Okay, so I have been asked to give the sort of international perspective on wildlife trafficking. And so what I want to just quickly start with and just that covered it a little bit is why reporting on wildlife crime is important. And that's, of course, not only because you have the opportunity to report on threatened species, but because wildlife crimes um, are crimes that undermine 
regional security and promote corruption. So they're also important from that perspective, as well as an accountability perspective. Investigative journals love accountability, right? So um, like just that said, these kinds of crimes often aren't taken as seriously by law enforcement and the justice system. And by reporting on them, you're going to be helping hold the law and justice system accountable for actually enforcing laws and cracking down on these types of crimes. And lastly, even though wildlife crime, the illegal wildlife trade has gotten a lot more attention in the past 10 years or so, there's still not a lot of journalists covering it which means there are a lot of stories left untold. You're not gonna have the same level of competition with other journalists reporting on wildlife crime as you would say on climate change or COVID. So there's a lot of opportunities and also you don't really need that much, you don't really need experience at all to report on these types of stories. If I work with reporters who have backgrounds in environmental journalism, in crime reporting, business and economics, um, science, so basically, there are a lot of different beats that prepare you to do these stories well. So, okay, global perspective, National Geographic, obviously we have a global audience. Um, and so we look for stories that, um, we often look at for a local story that we can then connect to a broader international trend, for example. So, Real quick, um, I oversee the animals desk, which is one of Nat Geo's five coverage areas. We also have science, history and culture, environment, travel, and then animals. And within animals, we have this small team called Wildlife Watch, which is dedicated to wildlife crime and exploitation reporting. So I wanna talk a little bit, I know a lot of you do write for local or regional audiences. But one of the benefits of being able to connect your story to a national or international framework is that those stories then feel a lot weightier and a lot more important to your audience. And so one of the ways we often go about doing that is, like I said, looking for the larger trend. So, for example, um, I've got news alerts set up for all kinds of different things, um, poaching, trafficking, you know, all the keywords you can think of. One great story we got was I saw a local news story that customs, I forget which country, had seized somebody's suitcase that had a lot of tarantulas in it. I remember thinking, well, that's kind of bizarre, but the story was too local. You know, customs seizes tarantulas is just not right for our audience. But what we ended up doing was looking into it deeper and we found out that there's actually a global trade in tarantulas. So we asked, all right, what species are involved? Who's doing the smuggling and why? What impact does this have on the animals? And where does the demand come from? Who are these people buying the tarantulas? And we ended up getting this great story that took a big look at the tarantula trade. I mean, whoever thought. So by looking for something local, and connecting it to a trend, you can basically nationalize or internationalize any of your stories. But what if you can't travel? So I know because of COVID or because of resources, doing field reporting is often difficult for these stories. And I will say that we actually do a lot of desk reported investigations. So by no means let, let a lack of resources hamper you. A couple of ways you can do these stories without traveling our um, social media as a reporting tool is fantastic, especially um, for gathering color and scenes that make it feel like um, to your reader that you were there. So for example, um, let's say you get a tip about, you know, there's a zoo where there's a lot of animal turnover, seems like there might be some illegal trade or a sanctuary that seems like maybe it's not a sanctuary or a Tiger King type facility where people are taking selfies and it feels like something's not right. You can go on Instagram and enter the facility's name or its location through their, uh, loc I think it's called the place search function and sort by recent and start scrolling through the photos. See both how the facility presents itself and how it looks through visitors' eyes. And so this example, um, my colleague Natasha Daly searched this location 
she saw this photo here of the monkey and that turned out to have been posted by this visitor here on the right. She ended up reaching out to him and talking to him about his experience and she suddenly had a new source and she had some reporting. She was able to describe some scenes from what he saw. Another technique we use is face, uh, FaceTime or Zoom travel. So you can go on a journalist Facebook group or um, work your own network and find somebody who's in the location that you need to report from and get them to just FaceTime you from there. It sounds kind of basic, but um, it's a great way to get color, to understand what a scene looks like and to sort of build up the narrative part of your story without actually traveling at all. And lastly, I just wanna emphasize do not underestimate the value of traditional reporting techniques. Like I said, we do a lot of our stories without any travel at all. Public records, working the phones and email, and just reading everything you can get your hands on will take you so far. So here I want to give you a checklist for how to get started reporting on wildlife crime. The first thing is to know your ecosystem. We went over this a little bit anyways, but, but start by thinking about, okay, who's my audience? What kinds of things are important to them? Are there national parks or reserves that are relevant to my audience? Are there particular species endemic to my country or that have some sort of cultural significance or economic significance? Um, learn about basically just what's happening in your own sphere. The second step is to just get a basic understanding of wildlife trade. Again, learn what laws govern the wildlife trade and wildlife conservation in your country, what agencies enforce them, and how they move through the justice system. Also, of course, a basic understanding of CITES. And honestly, one of the best things is GIJN published a guide um, earlier this year about how to report on wildlife trade and it is so in-depth I cannot recommend it enough so if you're interested just read through that and you will be set for reporting. The um, third step is to get yourself in a position where you start having stories fed to you. So sign up for email press releases uh, with every everybody you can think of, government agencies, NGOs, academic institutions, just make sure you're on their mailing lists. And reach out to PR folks. Um, I know you're not going to get like the juiciest, most inside scoop type stories from the PR folks, but you may get some exclusives from them if they like you. And if they like you, it's going to be a lot easier for you eventually to go directly to the sources that you want to go to without them giving you hassle. Um, and then, of course, once you have all of that groundwork laid, then you start getting into the more layered stuff. Then once you've gone through those steps, you're ready to start thinking about stories. So just said I already went over a lot of this, but I just want to emphasize that wildlife trafficking and wildlife trade is a hugely broad issue. There's so many different topics within it that you can report on. Um, anywhere along the supply chain, supply, transportation, demand, uh, law enforcement, justice, each one of those has a story to tell. You can also think about your stories from the perspectives of different characters. So here, for example, are some photos from a story I reported on uh, recently, the cheetah cub trade um, from the Horn of Africa to um, the Arabian Peninsula. You can put the story in terms of the animals as a character. You don't wanna overlook the suffering of animals. These really are crime stories, but also think about who the victims are. So you can write the stories about the animals. You can write the stories, you know, it's a good guy versus bad guy story. You've got your traffickers, your criminals, um, like the guy down in the lower left who is a high level cheetah cub trafficker. You have your more nuanced bad guys like poachers who are maybe doing it out of desperation, um, who I think are often more likely to be the real bad guys are um, maybe that's not the right word, but the consumers, because they're the ones who drive the demand. So for example, the people who want a pet cheetah so they can post about how rich and powerful they are on Instagram. And then of course, stories from the perspectives of the helper are 
are always great because they leave your readers with more of a sense of hope rather than you know, hopelessness. So for example, Minister Shukri in Somaliland, the environment minister has like single-handedly gotten the entire government of Somaliland behind her in trying to crack down on the cheetah trade. In terms of sources, um, take a look at the tip sheet. I left a really, really long list of potential sources um, on there. Lastly, I wanna leave you guys with some story seedlings, things you can get started with. These are all models that we use in National Geographic on a regular basis. So one model that I love is getting the inside scoop on a recently completed case. It's so much easier to report on wildlife investigations once they're closed, as anybody who's reported on any kind of crime knows. And that's because police are much more happy to talk to you. And by getting the inside story once a case is closed, you've got the resolution, which is always nice for readers, but you're also able to give them a behind the scenes look at how a particular trade works and how maybe it's been dismantled or at least how that particular aspect has been handled. You can request to go on patrol with a ranger or a game warden. At the very least, you're gonna you know, start cultivating a new source in that ranger and you know, maybe you'll be around for a seizure. You can take a closer look at the legal trade of something and see if it's providing cover for a parallel illegal trade. This is really common. So think about what legal wildlife trades happen in your country. They may be for food, uh, like sea urchins, maybe um, like ornamental plants, like orchids or succulents, aquarium fish, um, Anything like that, timber is a huge one. Think about what legal trades there are and start talking to law enforcement about what parallel illegal trades they might be covering up. Wander around a local market and see what's for sale. This is a great way to see what kinds of wildlife and wildlife products are in demand locally. Uh, you can also shadow a wildlife inspector or a customs agent at a port of entry, again, like a ranger at the very least. You're going to start cultivating a new source and at the best you're going to get you know maybe some action and then filing public records requests i love public records requests um one thing you can file requests for is to see what kind of wildlife imports have been seized by law enforcement in say the past five or ten years and this is why it's so important to know what laws your country has what agencies enforce them and make sure you understand all the bureaucracy that goes with that like what kinds of paperwork have to be filled out? Um, is there, do people need a permit to breed wildlife? Do they need to fill out an application to import or export it? Because once you understand what paperwork is associated, you know what records to request. And lastly, as we already talked about, examine loopholes in your country's breeding, wildlife trade and wildlife ownership laws. One story or one example I love to cite was in 2016, um, a Vietnamese rhino trafficking syndicate started um, sending prostitutes and strippers on rhino trophy hunts in South Africa. And because the trophy hunts were legal and is legal to export rhinos uh, parts as trophies, they were able to get rhino horn to Vietnam legally and then sell it illegally as, you know, not a trophy. So Often the stories won't be quite as juicy as that, but um, looking for loopholes is always, always uh, gonna turn up good stories. I've got a ton more information on the tip sheet, lots of more details um, about all of these things, and I'm around for questions. Feel free to reach out. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Rachel. Um, so, so much, uh, so many uh, story ideas coming from our two presenters. And let's move quickly to our final uh, presenter, Estacio, um, who is a Mozambican journalist and photographer who focuses on environmental crime and corruption in his country, Mozambique. Um, Estacio, you're here. And uh, then we'll move to uh, questions. Pistachio, please. 
Yes, I'm here. Let me share the screen with you. It's a pleasure to be here. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, we just had a good presentation for the first uh, two colleagues. And I'll try to go straight to what Oxpec have been doing all these years. Uh, and I try to highlight some of the techniques which I've been using uh, in different stores, or mainly in one of the stores I did recently. Uh, to talk about Oxpec, I could take all the time uh, or years. And as you can understand, if you do visit the Oxpec's page, you will find out that we'll be, we have been doing uh, Different of kind, different kind of uh, investigation using different kind of tools, techniques, uh, tips, and uh, and so on. Uh, one of the issues which I came across when I was doing uh, one of my recent investigation was mainly focused on data. One of the main techniques uh, which uh, I have, I mean, techniques and uh, of course, uh, um, sources, uh, I had to focus on traditional ones. First, looking to the Mozambican contest where uh, we don't have uh, enough data in terms of uh, conservation, in terms of a court case, in terms of uh, from the judicial, from the police, uh, from conservation organization, one of the main thing was exactly to go back to the community people. Why exactly going back to the community people? Because many of the crimes start exactly from the communities when uh, we come to the wildlife trafficking in different, we're talking about different species. Uh, we start from with the community, which uh, we have uh, them as the first people involved in it. Then we have uh, the poacher, the transporter, the kingpin, and uh, the distribution network. Uh, to come with this investigation, which was exactly about data, not because of COVID, but mainly, as I just mentioned, there's a lack of data. So how was possible to tackle this issue? without uh, uh, too much information in terms of data when we're talking in terms of uh, conservation organization and the Mozambican judicial system, the police. I had only to rely, first of all, on the community people. I could not go there. I wish it to go there. But one of the things I had to do was to call back to the people inside and try to find out if the level of crime did diminish or was continued. And that this happened exactly or during the time when uh, the South African government ended up releasing about uh, 83 uh, Mozambican detainees, <coughs> which have been involved in wildlife crime, and that they all uh, went back to Mozambique. At the same time was a case which happened in uh, Zimbabwe uh, where uh, the official police end up uh, uh, helping some of the some of the kingpins which were involved in trafficking which end up crossing to Mozambique. I'll try now to go to Um, okay. I'm trying to find. We're trying to bring up. The yes. But okay, anyway, so I had to collect all this information from the community, people, from the locals. And uh, from there, I did try up with some staff members of the conservation unit local 
if some of the case did end up in court or not. Because talk with the people from the judicial was extremely difficult. And that the only way I could have all this data, at least to start, was to rely on the local community people and uh, staff from the reserves or parks. In this case, I'm talking about um, rangers. And uh, with some of the official uh, from the conservation parks local, you were able to tell me that were cases which were taken to the police. But uh, there's no information or official information about it. But from the other side, I had the official information or a conservation organization, which uh, came uh, with uh, numbers of cases which were taken to the court. Uh, some were prosecuted, some were detained, uh, some were prosecuted and uh, convicted. But in the other side, I end up looking to the government uh, data. The number of uh, people which have been uh, detained and convicted, example, during the last uh, five years, did not match with the um, with the number of cases which uh, uh, end up uh, acquiring from this uh, uh, conservationist uh, conservationist organization, and that did not match as well with the numbers of cases which did happen in community. So how to use all these numbers and involve these numbers from the community which were useful without example undermining uh, all the investigation or end up also being involved in litigations which could discredit not all the store but also I could end up example being prosecuted. The only mechanism I found out was to rely only on the conservationist uh, data, because if you look at government data, as I did say, uh, was a gap and the loops on it. And that was not described uh, as the data which I acquired from the conservationist. And that the main mechanism was to rely on the on the data from the conservationist. And that by not being able to be on the field, as I did mention before, not all because of COVID, because usual uh, we faced issues of uh, uh, not all about lack of money, but the security issues and so on. Uh, one of the things was to try to use a, a geomap. Because the jail map could give me exactly uh, the location where this kind of crime uh, was committed. I mean, location indicated many local communities. That's why I was uh, highlighting here the, the issue and the importance of having a local community or people inside the community, which uh, in uh, several occasions, uh, they end up even protecting you more than the, the, the more than the state. To generate the data, as I was saying, was uh, to come with the three main uh, focus, which was exactly the community, uh, the conservation organization, which uh, uh, is a good one when I talk about the Mozambican contest, which is called ANAC. And, uh, with information from the Mozambican government, uh, which was um, uh, wasn't much, was so broad, and uh, I had to to look to all this, uh, compare all this information, in order to acquire, first of all, a good data between these three, these three. I could say organization, talk about local people, government, and uh, the conservation. 
And as I was saying, I also had to use a tool such as a GeoMap, not only to acquire uh, that in terms of, uh, but also to make sure that the data which are already acquired from these three institutions was uh, uh, reliable and that goes according to what was on the ground. And uh, of course, it wasn't also an uh, uh, easy process. Uh, I could have used an example, uh, a drone. So imagine yourself, for example, using a drone uh, in a wall field. Uh, could not be possible. It could be even tracked. You know, they could even think that, for example, you, you're one of the bandits. So the best way was exactly to come with the geomap uh, uh, satellites, uh, still also facing different problems. Uh, recently, the Mozambican government uh, did exactly elect one prosecutor in each province so that this prosecutor could work exactly on environmental crimes. But the level of knowledge uh, from this prosecutor is still low. And that even if we are talking about sharing information, it takes time. Uh, in this investigation, the information did require example from the uh, Mozambican general prosecutor, uh, or the department. I always receive this information after the investigation was published. And at some time, this could also undermine the investigation in terms of uh, uh, publication and uh, also could give an opportunity uh, for those which were involved in these kind of crimes uh, to, let's say, to vanish or to run away. And uh, that's how we end up uh, uh, come with this story. And uh, in terms of tips, as I said, uh, as website is rich on it, end up involving not all of what we've been doing uh, in Mozambique, in Africa, but uh, a little bit uh, in the entire world, from Mozambique to China, uh, Vietnam, if we look in terms of uh, uh, final destinations, example, I mean, the main final destinations. So you can uh, visit and uh, you will see the, uh, the different tools and uh, tips uh, available for having a good investigation. And of course, uh, a good pitch always helps when uh, we are doing this kind of investigation because we have to know exactly what we're looking for. Uh, otherwise, uh, we'll waste our time without knowing exactly uh, what we want to expose and uh, what uh, we want and uh, mainly uh, in terms of public interest will end up undermining all the investigation on story. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, your deck and your tip sheets, and actually all the tip sheets and, and the slide sets will be uh, posted for uh, access. Now, we have a lot of questions and we'll try to get to as many as possible. The first question is about COVID-19. How has that affected uh, reporting? Um, I know Rachel mentioned about um, how to cover uh, when we cannot traveling. Now, um, maybe I'll start with Jessit. How does COVID-19 affect your the reporting um, and uh, stories in, in Asia and in your area? Jessit? Sure, um, thanks for the question. Um, you know, COVID-19 actually caused a slowdown in, in at least in Asia of, of wildlife crime, uh, mainly because of the closed borders and the lockdowns. Um, but a report actually that was published by Monga Bay, I think this year, showed that even though 
wildlife crime is essentially not there physically on the ground, social media ads continue to proliferate in places such as Facebook and Instagram. And one of the issues that some reporters and investigators are looking at right now is the evidence of stockpiling. And so while, you know, some traffickers and traders cannot do their usual selling of products and perhaps derivatives of, of wildlife, they resort to piling them so that when the borders open, they could resume selling and trading them in the usual way that they do. Um, in terms of reporting, I think Rachel has already mentioned that it has really also changed how reporting is done, at least physically, but it's still possible to do to do stories on wildlife crime, even though... Um, even though there's COVID and the lockdowns. Um, as mentioned, there's still um, trade uh, happening in, in social media. So it's still very important to keep a close eye on that. Um, Rachel, does COVID-19 come under your radar? We ended up having to put a lot of stories on hold because of COVID-19. Um, like I said, while there are a lot of techniques for getting around the need for field reporting, um, ultimately at a certain point, nothing can replace it. So with you know lockdowns and travel restrictions and just you know the risk, um, there was a lot of field reporting we couldn't do. Um, as far as story topics go, we actually we've done a couple of stories about the increase um, in poaching, especially um, in illegal hunting for wild meat because as the economy slowed down, people lost their jobs. Um, some people were forced to look for other sources of income and other sources of meat. So we did see an increase in that. And then also, um, like just that said, um, a slowdown in trafficking, but likely because things are being stockpiled. So one possibility is uh, go after the stockpile. So it's and uh, there could be a, a story there. And actually in Hong Kong, we have a lot of stockpile of uh, ivory um, because it's being banned. Um, and uh, so now here's another question on tourism. Tourism has also been impacted. Um, I'm gonna throw the question to all three of our presenters. Um, what is the impact of tourism on wildlife trafficking? And please be brief because we're running out of time soon and we want to go to more questions. Impact of tourism. Uh, Astasio, you want to start? Yeah, uh, I'll give a simple example. Uh, without wildlife, uh, we end up not having tourism. Uh, one example, uh, I mentioned COVID, COVID also. Uh, if you look, for example, to Kruger Park, the number of people visiting the, the park uh, reduced a lot. And uh, without wildlife, nobody's going to visit an empty park. So the impact is huge uh, for communities which uh, depends on the money which comes from the tourism, uh, the government tax as well. Uh, I'm talking also in terms of uh, balance, uh, the, the conservation, because if we don't have a wildlife, other animals also end up uh, or increasing the number, there's nothing to balance. So there's a huge impact, I mean, many impact. Huge impact. Um, Jesse? Huge impact. Um, yes. Well, maybe if we look at it from the context of, of zoos, for example, I mean, tourists also visit certain countries to look at certain animals and some of these are being kept in zoos. And there are um, some investigations by organizations that find that zoos also can be potential cover, legal cover for wildlife that is being trafficked into their borders or being uh, bred. Uh, within. So there are certain laws in prospective countries when it comes to breeding wildlife and other traded animals. So I think it's different in every country, in every situation. But but yeah, that's that's one thing that uh, reporters can also look into. Richo? Uh Yeah, similar to 
the um, zoos being desperate without a lack of tourists, we've seen the same um, with like safari tourism um, in parts of Africa and elephant tourism in Thailand, for example. Um, like in Thailand, a lot of um, companies that own elephants for elephant rides haven't been able to feed their animals. It's it's been really tragic. So the lack of tourism has been a big problem. Um, yes. Now we have a question from Sean Philippi Sepi for everyone. Can you elaborate on the financial channels of these traffic? Can we trace the profits into whitewashing the outlets in countries where wildlife trafficking is not considered as criminal? Financial channels and possibility of whitewashing the money. Any thoughts, observations? Uh, it's uh, not. It's uh, not easy to look uh, or to track the financial issue when I talk about uh, wildlife. In a sense, that uh, how 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 could we say? Uh, okay, we can we can track looking to the people involved on uh, on wildlife traffic in terms of starting from the main kingpins uh, and of course based on our investigation it means that uh, if it's the kingpin most of that money comes exactly for illegal activities involved wildlife crime but how to follow that money, example, to a tax haven or watch money, as you were saying, that is another is another issue. It means that we connected uh, to some of the banks, uh, so we can acquire this kind of information if this sits or that sits and have been uh, allocating money outside or not. We have, uh, example, stores of a Pandora, Pandora box, if we talk about uh, tax seven. And uh, if you look to the financial in terms of our locals, uh, which at the end of the day, they end up acquiring nothing. They become, or they remain poor, and they become more poor while the people in the middle uh, are getting rich. So in the wildlife crimes, all the wildlife crimes, uh, those, who are directly involved, involved in the purchase or the people uh, uh, producing the flowers or so on, they end up usual with less money than those in power. So this is how the money end up circulate from the bottom to the top. And uh, who end up paying the locals? Uh, those people uh, with the money starts from the kingpin, where's the middleman? And that the middleman, of course, it was the one who ended up hiring the local. And uh, of course, the money also goes to the transportation. And as I was saying, the final budget, when we talk about the who end up benefit more, is the, the major the major kingpin. And of course, in some case, uh, when I'm talking about uh, the major kingpins, end up finding out. Uh, that uh, government people are also involved in it. So we cannot look also to the kingpins in terms of uh, that businessman or that famous, let me say, famous guy involved on Timba because he's also involved in, on uh, mm -hmm. Pangoli and uh, uh, base traffic. No, we we'll also have to go a little bit deep looking to the uh, political uh, scenario than to the bankers, I mean, because the bank, the banks end up also helping all this process of money transfer, and uh, almost all end up uh, taking the money to the bank. Of course, that those which end up uh, putting the money in this small so, can. So on the the challenge is going after kingpins, right? Um, do you see that in the Philippines and Asia, Jesse? I think there needs to be more efforts into, at least in the context of the Philippines and Southeast Asia, in going after actually the kingpins. Like, as I mentioned in my presentation, usually they're the ones who can easily get away. They have the money, they have the resources, and, you know, the small time poachers can easily be 
left wayward, they can easily be replaced. Um, in, in the context of the Philippines, at least, I know that the Environment Ministry is working closely with uh, money laundering um, or uh, anti-money laundering um, agency of the government. So I think, as I mentioned earlier, it is important not to cage wildlife trafficking stories as mere environmental or wildlife stories because essentially it is a big part of an organized crime. And so we may never know the same people that have been uncovered in the Pandora Papers or in the Panama Papers may be the same actors that are involved in you know, illegal wildlife trade. Uh, Rachel, you, anything you want to add in terms of the financial channels of profits yeah, from I, trafficking? Um, I just wanted to note that we're increasingly seeing, at least in the US and Europe, um, law enforcement using um, financial laws to go after wildlife traffickers. They're harder cases to make, obviously, but they tend to carry much heavier penalties than wildlife crime laws do. So if somebody is going after a kingpin, for example, they might use um, like anti-money laundering laws to make that prosecution a lot more harsher than it otherwise would be. Uh, we have four minutes left. Uh, we, if we cannot answer the questions, I would urge the panelists to answer them in the chat uh, because the, the recording and the chat records will be kept. And so we can continue the conversation online. Um, actually, I want to uh, throw a one last round question on to everybody is on the issue of cross-border investigation. Now, do you see cross-border investigation as necessary, critical, indispensable, given that we're talking about trafficking it involves two countries at least? Um, so what do you think of this cross-border investigation? Is it indispensable challenges? I think it depends what kind of story you want to do, because obviously wildlife trafficking is a cross-border issue, but there are plenty of good and important stories you can do that are focused only on a particular community or a particular country. Jesse? Um, I think with the magnitude of, of wildlife crime, it is, as I echo what Rachel has said, that while there are local stories that, of course, need to be doggedly pursued, um, collaboration between not just journalists, but conservation groups and academics are, is very important, is key in, in wildlife trafficking. I'd like to throw a bit of a, a applause here to, to Ying and your group in the Environmental Reporting Collective doing great work on, on not just pangolins, but recently on oceans. And I think this is a very uh, crucial example of how collaborative uh, journalism can open more doors in, in terms of investigating um, crimes against wildlife. And essentially, not just crimes against wildlife, but crimes against the communities and the people who are intricately tied with, with, with the whole ecosystem. Thank you. Well, I have, that's why I have the ocean as my backdrop. I'm not on a boat or a ship, but the ocean is the latest package of stories that we've uh, released. And I'll, I'll post a link um, in the chat room as well. Um, now, we're, so I have just told by the producers that we can go over time a bit, um, not too much, but um, so we can take another question. Here we have a question from Clara. For my data journalism class in university, I will write a data-driven article about the impact. Oh, this is on tourism. So, do you have any tips on good databases? Any databases related to tourism? Or ways to create our own, like what Astacio did with the Oxpeckers? There's a database, this is very specific, but there is a database of cetaceans, whales, dolphins, porpoises kept in captivity and um, how they're 
you know, who owns them and when they're traded and things like that. So, I mean, that's very specific, but Something that makes to sense. Work on. <laughs> um, we have another question on data from uh, Gerald Flynn to everyone. Uh, thank you for all your insights. He, he wanted to ask in jurisdictions like Cambodia, you navigate a lack of official data on wildlife crimes, government and security institutions that are ov overtly hostile to the press and a very limited range of NGOs working in this space. So what can be done to deal with this? In countries, there's little data available, government is hostile, civil society is weak. What can we do? Any good advice? I mean, uh, uh, in this context, uh, we'll, have to, uh, we'll have to rely uh, on uh, outside database. As uh, just I did mention, uh, cross-border investigation always helps when we tackle this kind of issue. We are in our homeland, we have a lack of information. And uh, mainly when we talk about hostile, uh, hostile counters. Yes. And of course, yes. in this case, we have to use a different uh, kind of tools in terms of, uh, of security, because uh, the government's not going to give you any data. Uh, if there's some organization local, they might give you, and uh, local people as well might give you, that's the way of collecting this information uh, because we, we will always have to go to the bottom line starting from I mean in this kind of case we'll rely on uh, that for other organization but we'll have to go deep to our local communities to know from them in terms of uh, what kind of data they have because uh, Sometimes we think that data is all what, what they are published by conservation organization or the government. And uh, we forget uh, mainly, I would like to remind people like uh, if we talk about Mozambique or Africa, the oral language is the first one. So we'll have to go there and sit with them. They are drink tea or on the fire, then we'll have uh, some kind of information. Um, yes, I uh, urge everybody yes. to check out Oxpackers, the uh, mapping and how they created uh, databases um, when data is not so much uh, available. Uh, now, okay, we're wrapping this up, but then I saw this uh, answer of Rachel in the chat box. She said, pitch me. Pitch me. Can you elaborate on that? Because I, I think there'll be a lot of people who will love to pitch. To Sorry, I threw that in. Ah. Somebody had asked earlier, much earlier, I forgot who asked how we avoid parachute journalism. Um, and the answer is we work with a lot of freelancers who are reporting on their own countries. Um, we only have two staff reporters who are dedicated to these stories. So most of our, most of our stories are from freelancers. Um, so yeah, we're always open to pitches. I'm always looking for good stories on wildlife trade. So I dropped my email in there. And also if you just Google how to pitch Nat Geo, you'll find a page that has um, a lot more specifics about what we're looking for and how to submit pitches. Okay, that's, that's uh, great. Um... So thank you very much. I want to thank all the presenters for your great work and your efforts and the insights you've shared. Uh, let our conversation continue online and hopefully we'll have more um, collaborations and local and international stories coming out from this uh, session and wildlife being such a um, very, very critical uh, issue and involves organized crime, finance, uh, money laundering, whitewashing, and all the ugly uh, uh, issues that uh, cover um, other aspects of, of life and corruption. Um, thank you again, and thank you for the producers behind the scene, <laughs> just keeping, helping to keep things in order. 
thanks to the um, GIJN and uh, everybody please enjoy the conference. Thank you very much. <laughs>